So what happens when something is out of place at your house? I mean, some houses like ours, there's a lot of things out of place, but the things that you always put in the same place, uh, like maybe the keys before you go out in the morning, you come home at night, you put them on the same table. What happens when something like that is not there when you expect it to be there? It's just something is is out of line. Something just is not matching up. You You always put them in exactly the same place, so it's supposed to be but it's not and it causes some chaos it makes you feel a little odd and you're rushing around trying to figure out where these keys are well what about something that's even more important a person or a you know somebody who a lost child for instance who uh, you know you you just they're not where they're supposed to be uh, and there's a there's a moment of panic or or um, a teen is not at home when they're supposed to be at the time they were supposed to be and so worry starts to to creep in so what happens when the people of God are not where they're supposed to be well, we're going to look at that a little bit this morning and see why the fit seems so odd currently with the world and why things don't seem to be fitting um, as we had uh, thought they would and maybe how the Lord thinks they should. Um, about maybe six months ago or so, Rebecca brought home a 500-piece puzzle and um I have a love-hate relationship with puzzles, so I I, uh, I saw it, and so as a family, we were trying to uh, to do it. Uh, I, I realize what I don't really like about them. Uh, mainly, it's the fact that when you pick up two pieces that think they're going to be uh, together and kind of gonna it's going to be an easy fit, they don't match, and it's always sort of a disappointment when they don't click in. So you're, just, you're turning it around, trying to make it fit in. I like it when you actually find one and it clicks in and you go, ah, that's how puzzles are supposed to be. But of course, with a thousand piece puzzle, um, the last one we worked on, it didn't happen uh, very, uh, very often. So uh, to me, the world uh, looks um, a lot like, at least currently, um, lately, more like pieces that don't fit. Um, pieces that are out of place and, and not where God intends them to be. They're, they're just, things are not aligned the way that uh, I think the Lord would have intended for the world. So we begin a new series next week that deals with what happens when a group of people are not where God expects them to be. You know, how they got there and, and how do they get back? They're, they're out of place. They're lost, you could say. And we saw the result uh, last week as Pastor Joyce uh, gave a powerful uh, look at a world in chaos from um, 2 Timothy, a world where uh, people who were not as God intended, doing things not that God wanted them to do, a world the Bible calls the last days. And uh, Paul uh, said this about that in 2 Timothy 3, uh, 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, uh, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and on and on the list goes. Love, uh, Paul loves those lists, as uh, Pastor Joyce mentioned. But don't lose heart because uh, Linda officially begins our series and the world will be right once again once she, she teaches. Uh, maybe not, but she'll have some insightful things to say in any event. And I think it, it, it looks to be a series that's a little different than we've done before, uh, a little broader. It's from the Old Testament primarily. And uh, anyway, it's going to be great. It's going to be an interesting uh, look at scripture. But this week, we again have another introduction of sorts that frames a different aspect of our series to come. The heart of God to restore and to restore completely. Um, open your Bibles, if you would, to Luke 15, 1. The basic idea here is that lowly, outcast, and rejected people, those rejected by society, are accepted by God. But certainly, 
not always by others. The three parables we're going to look at follow this basic theme. And um, in fact, right before these, there's another parable in Luke 14. It talks about the parable of the great banquet. I love this story because it's, it's um, a master who has prepared this unbelievable feast, sort of like God would do. And he's calling out for people to come to the feast. Come, come enjoy this, all of this free food. Now, in that culture, this would have been a huge thing to have all of this. And it, it's free and wonderful. And the master has made it, all, invited everybody and made this all here, this wonderful meal. And uh, people are making excuses as to why they can't come many of them. And so the servants from go back to the master and say, you know, people are making excuses. They, they won't come. And so uh, he gets angry. And, and um, he says to his, his servants, uh, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And they will come and enjoy this feast that these other people have rejected. And so uh, these parables we'll look at today are similar in, in um, that aspect is it's the downtrodden, those rejected by society that the Lord lifts up, accepts, and uh, they even seem to be more open to the things of God often than, uh, than just regular people uh, going on day to day. It's sometimes the needy um, are, are longing for something, longing to be accepted. And we'll see that in these stories is um, as uh, Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and the scribes uh, who uh, reject the downtrodden and re reject, reject those who are um, uh, of uh, the lower parts of society in that culture. Um, uh, they start to realize that Jesus does not reject them, but the religious elite do. And so uh, it's, it's a great story um, for, uh, for us to look at uh, as we look at God's acceptance and restoration of people. So first of all, in Luke 15, 3 to 7, there's the story of the lost sheep. And it reads like this, <clears throat> what man of you, uh, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one, does not leave the 99 in the open country and, and go after the one that's lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Uh, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The next one, next story, is, is almost exactly the same, except it's a lost coin. Same thing, the coin is lost, diligent, uh, looking, searching for the coin. It's found, there's rejoicing with uh, friends and neighbors, and um, it ends the same way. Uh, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I had lost. And just so I tell you, uh, Jesus says, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So both parables have the same basic idea. Something very valuable was lost. A serious search takes place. The, the item is found. And then a celebration of rejoicing with family and friends. Heaven and angels, in essence, God accepts those with repentant hearts. And so the third uh, parable we're going to look at is the prodigal son. It's in Luke 15, starting at verse 11. So let's look at this one a little bit more closely, because this leads us to this truth about God's acceptance and God's restoration of his people. Remember, the, the key in all of this is restoration, but it comes from repentance. And we'll talk about that in, in just uh, a minute. So uh, before I get into this, though, there's uh, Rembrandt painted two pictures of this uh, parable. And um, 
they're both beautiful in in uh, their way. It's a style that you have to sort of get used to. This old world um, style, it's much different than we see today if you're a connoisseur of paintings. Um, but uh, it's interesting how he painted them. He painted two, and they're both come from sort of different angles. <clears throat> At that time, painters who had these these stories, especially the prodigal son, they they interestingly they keyed in on the um, the son who had gone away, but he had gone away to a really raunchy life, a, a, a life of sin, and and so there are multiple paintings in in the time periods around Rembrandt where uh, the paintings revolve around um, the, the uh, son, the prodigal son, who had left his father, gone away, taken the inheritance, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And uh, he ends up in wild life, in, in including probably brothels. And so the paintings uh, often have these, these uh, men in, in brothel kinds of settings. Um, they aren't you know, too um, crazy looking from the point of view of, of uh, what's around today, I'm sure. But at that time, they were racy. And so um, Rembrandt also painted one of those types of uh, paintings where uh, it's called the, the Sun at the Brothel, I believe, something like that. But uh, later in his life, he painted, um, I think, a more powerful uh, one, which is um, the son um, kneeling before the father uh, and receiving the acceptance and the forgiveness of the father despite everything that the son had done. And um, it, it's, it's a very powerful, I think, moving uh, painting. Um, so let's take a look at, at these, um, these, this particular story and what we can, what we can get uh, from it. So the father's reaction in this parable is very telling. It points directly to what we need to know as we start our series. Um, along with the lesson of acceptance by God of a son who repents, the parable mirrors uh, the people of Israel as they walked away from God multitudes of times over many, many, many years. Uh, a perfect picture of what happens when God's people are not where they're supposed to be, when they walk away from their creator. And uh, we're going to look at it this particular uh, piece because it's significant that we learn this lesson before we start to go into the reality of these uh, people who have left God at various times and what happens to them. So we're going to look at this first and, and look at God's heart. In verses um, 11 through 13 in chapter 15, it says this, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property that's coming to me. I want what I deserve. And he divided the property between him and, and uh, another brother. Not many days later, it says, the younger son gathered all he had, took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in, in, in reckless living. The whole scenario is, is odd, um, and it would have been very odd to the people listening uh, to this, who were still the scribes and the Pharisees. They had heard the other two parables, and they were still there uh, listening to Jesus as he, he taught um, about this particular thing. And um, um, the younger brother got the inheritance he asked for. But it was very odd because um, firstborn children get the inheritance in that culture. Um, the disrespect of the younger son showed to the father and the family was beyond anything that would have been tolerated at the time. So Jesus is telling a, a wild story that is um, uh, causing people to go, what? Uh, I, you know, what did the son do? Would have been shocking to them. And in fact, a son who treated his father like this could be stoned to death. 
this was very serious, and the fact that the father even allowed it is beyond uh, understanding. So the picture Jesus is painting is one of the worst kind of sin and rebellion, abandonment, uh, a shaking up of a, of a fist in the face of the Father and saying, I don't want to live here anymore. That's it. I, I don't want to work with you. I don't want to, um, to be here. I want my money. I want to go. So the picture is completely of self and sin. Uh, he had become his own idol. He was worshiping himself, basically. He had replaced his God. He had replaced his God. He was acting in that role. Jesus portrays this worst scenario that could be imagined, and in a shame-based culture, the Father would have been devastated in this. It's a parable. It's a story that Jesus is telling. It's not a real story, um, but could be based on, on things that have happened, but it's beyond uh, anything that they would have ever heard about uh, at this level of, of um, trouble, really, this level, this kind of a son, this kind of, of rebellion. You know, I have a, a um, toy. I love toys. Uh, I have, have always loved them. I just, as a designer, I just, I love the color. I love, you know, I just love them. And one of the things that um, Linda got me one year was a, a toy called Zolo. And it's a toy, but it's also changeable. It's, it's just shapes that are, are brightly colored. And um, it's like an art toy. It's, it's like handmade. And it's, it's beautiful. Um, if you don't like it, you just sort of change it. So you could spend hours just taking pieces apart and putting them back together. It's like a creative uh, erector set or uh, Legos maybe, but all the pieces are different shapes, so very creative. And uh, you just, if you don't like it, you just change it. Yeah, that's as simple as that. And that's sort of the picture here with the sun. He just decided that he was going to live a different way and decided that God was removable from his life. I'm just going to do what I know. All the things I know that are wrong, I'm just going to do those now. I've just chosen. So he's he's just basically taken a piece and he's moved it over here and he's taken another piece and he said, okay, this is the way I'm going to do it at this point. So self and sin are the, the main things with that particular um, beginning of this story. So in, in 1514, it says, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country that he had gone to, and he began to be in need. So he went, he hired himself out um, to be one of the, the uh, another one of the citizens of that country. And that, that person, that master, sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to, to, be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. He was so desperate. He was starving. He said, but no one gave him anything. So as we saw uh, initially, the son takes off and decides to leave, to go off on his own. He's decided to go his own direction. The story, uh, this particular part of it, gets even worse because he was starving and not only that, as a Jewish man, more uh, degradation as he had to work with pigs. And, and it says in there that no one gave him anything. All the connections were God. And for, for a Jewish person, community was everything. All this community had disappeared. There's a phrase uh, I like from a famous uh, advertising um, executive um, and it applies to many areas of our, uh, of our faith. And it's called, afflict the comfortable. Make the people reading that ad a little troubled by what they're seeing. Catch them off guard. Make them squirm a little. The Lord does this with us to get our attention. Wakes us up. Uh, to upset the apple cart is sort of what he does. He he has to, at times, to say, wait a minute, you're going in the wrong direction. And so uh, I always like to try to think myself 
about things that are happening in my life? Is the Lord trying to say something to me and I'm not getting the message? Well, in this particular case, the, uh, the guy, the son who had uh, left his father and was now starving, started to remember what it was like at home. And although it would have taken a lot of courage, he started to think about what was there and what he had with the pigs and, and eating what they ate, basically. So in 1517, it says uh, this and a wonderful line. It says, but when he came to himself or when he came to his senses, he said, well, how many of my father's hired servants? have more than enough bread, but I perish here in hunger. I will arise, I'll go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He had a realization that things needed to change. Did he have to wait until he was starving? Maybe not, but the picture Jesus is painting is a man totally unworthy to accept it back. He he just he was in a place um, uh, broken by his circumstances, and he probably thought I would think if if this were to be a, a real story, I would think that he would probably be saying to himself. You know what? I I gotta I gotta change. I gotta get out of here. But it's not so easy when you're in the middle of issues like that to have the courage, the humility to come back and to say, "I have made a mistake. I, I'm huge." To say "I'm sorry" is just so hard for people. Um, but as believers, it's got to be something that becomes easier and easier for us as we grow. In the Lord, so this this picture is a man totally unworthy by any cultural standard of being accepted back. He's broken by him circumstances, and at least he now had this understanding of who he was. No longer deceiving himself, he had reached the bottom and said, "Maybe I could go back." And um, I've had a lot of these types of situations in the pastorate. The, the, the latest one uh, that I had where I had a, like a light bulb experience uh, was, was um, on vacation this last August. And I, I thought to myself as I was reading a book um, that the church really needs to make disciples. <laughs> now, you know, that's pretty standard, Jim. Uh, you didn't know that? I mean, that's kind of what the church is supposed to do, right? I knew it in theory, but I needed a revelation of how serious it was. Maybe maybe not a revelation. Maybe it's better called a revolution to open my eyes to what it really meant to be a disciple. I had to deal with that myself. What does it mean? It's, you know, it's all fun and games until you start telling people that they have to die to themselves, <laughs> abandon their will, and follow Jesus without hesitation. It's all good until that point. And so being a disciple is is different than just being a Christian or a believer. And so I had to put it in a new perspective in my mind. And I guess I had just missed it. And um, it was not good. So I, I, I think I had a bit of deception in my mind thinking that um, people really didn't, didn't, need, didn't need to be like this. I mean, it wasn't that hard. But in reality, um, it is. It is. And God helps us, obviously. Uh, the Holy Spirit gives us the, the peace we need through difficult situations as we grow and learn how to be disciples. But nevertheless, um, God calls us uh, to be disciples, and it's a high calling. I'm sure, by the way, at this point, the Pharisees and the scribes were saying, you know, good, he deserved what he got. 
this kid. He spent all of his father's inheritance, was, was willingly um, uh, apart to, in the middle of sin after sin, living with Gentiles, no community around him to help, feeding pigs, starving. He got uh, exactly what he deserved. He, he did the wrong thing to the father, and, and this is what he deserved. So the scribes and Pharisees were right along with this story with Jesus. And then in 1520, um, there's a part of the story where I think that the scribes and the Pharisees probably started to go, uh-oh, you know what? Because it says in verse 20, he rose and came to the father. But while he was still a long way off, it says his father saw him felt compassion and ran and embraced him, kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his, his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and, and kill it and, and let us eat and celebrate for my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now, this is a part of the story that had the, the Pharisees probably livid. Um, the, the last half of this story we're not going to cover uh, today, but it's uh, verses 25 through 32 about the older brother who um, was the one who was really, Jesus was saying, was like the Pharisees. And when you read that part of the story, you'll see why the Pharisees and scribes were probably even even more mad than, than this part of the story when they saw that the, the, uh, the father, the way the father had treated the son. But let's look at the father's reaction closely here and, and see what we can learn about um, God and, and how he deals with those, those, those created who walk away from their creator. So the father reacted um, uh, to his son uh, in a way that was very, I don't know, something that, that would not have ever been... Um, I guess, thought of at the time. I mean, it, it almost is uh, beyond um, possibility that a father would have acted like this after the son had treated him like this. But that's how the father reacted. The possibility uh, of the son returning was probably low in the father's eyes, although it says that he was looking for him. He was longing for him to, to come back. Jesus had painted quite a picture of an unlovable child, rebellious, doing really everything wrong. It, it, the father here is a picture of God and how God treats the, those that repent, those that humble themselves, that change, that ask for God's forgiveness. All three stories, by the way, mention repentance, and we probably know what this means, but for the sake of continued learning, repentance means to turn around. It, it doesn't mean you're sorry, although it may involve that. Um, it's to go in the opposite direction. The word means to turn around, to head in a different direction. Uh, it's the realization that you've done something that you need to be covered of, taken away, that the sin needs to be taken away. It needs to be covered so it's not holding on to you anymore. And God is the one that does that. He's the one that can forgive. And then because you're facing the other direction now, you, you don't go back to do it again. And then you walk in confidence, believing God has forgiven you. You, you do not continue to beat yourself up uh, because um, God has forgiven you and said, uh, go on. You, you, this is not something that has a hold on you any longer. I've forgiven you. And so you go with confidence saying, yes, God has forgiven me. 
that's the one of the most wonderful things in the world in Christianity about the Father is this forgiveness of sin. It does not have to hold us down, destroy our lives. It's something God forgives. So the father saw him from a long way off, ran up to him. There's not a hint of the father ever saying, I told you so. You shouldn't have done this. See what happened to you? It's not in the, not in the story. Jesus left that out. The father saw him a long way off, and he ran to him, right? The father ran to him. He isn't sitting there waiting with his arms crossed. He was running to see the lost son. He felt compassion. And by the way, it says he felt compassion in, in that story. Uh, and it was a feeling he had before the son's confession. See, the love is there from God uh, toward the broken and those who've sinned long before they get to the point of ever saying, I'm sorry to God, confessing it and wanting to change. God still, the compassion is there, the love is there before even that. He loved us really before we even understood what love was, right? He loved us first. He embraced him and he he kissed him. By the way, in that, that culture, a sign of forgiveness and of restoration of a broken relationship, that, that embrace and that that kiss also, by the way, before the confession of the, the son, embraced him and kissed him, a sign of forgiveness and restoration of a broken relationship. See, God was way ahead of him. He, he, this, this is exactly what um, Jesus wanted to get across uh, to everyone listening. The initiative in all of this was taken by the father. He was taken by the Father. He was the one who moved to him. Uh, The Son begins to repeat the predetermined confession, uh, and the the Father interrupts him. Remember it says, and the Son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and of you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your Son. And before he could go on, the father said, well, servants, bring the servants, have them get the best robe and the ring and the shoes. The father didn't even let him finish the confession that he had memorized. It's, it's the exact words that he had said before, except he wasn't able to finish <laughs> the last part of it. The father was already there giving him what he used to have, full restoration. And, and he calls for uh, to, to dress him. And it's interesting because it's almost like he's, he's dressing him in the clothes that the son wore before he left. The best robe. Some commentators think that best may refer to a previous robe, one that he had owned before. And a ring, uh, not an ornament, but a symbol of authority. It was something that the son would have worn in the house as um, one of the sons of the master. Shoes, a sign that a person was a freedman, not a slave. The, the master wore shoes in the house, by the way. Not all the guests, when, when the guests came, all the guests removed their shoes before entering, but he's bringing him the shoes. Again, a, a sign of, of authority, of possession, of, of him being part of the house, being part of the family, being restored. And lastly, a party. And the animal um, in the language that's used here is was one that was uh, especially fed and kept for a special occasion. It was it was done for this special time, you know. Um, it wasn't just one of the normal flock or one of the normal herd that was just taken. It was one that was uh, being readied. If we were to read too much into the story, 
uh, maybe keeping it um, for the sun to come back, but doesn't say that. The best part about all of this, and it ends with total restoration, is the Father says at the very end, you know, we, we have to do this. This is what we have, we have to do because he was dead and now he is alive. This is in verse 24. My son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found and they begin to celebrate. Total restoration. And that's the God we worship. That's the one who comes and can offer that to, to all of us. Uh, whether it's before we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, or it's issues uh, as we're living as Christians that we need to return to him. But that's the, that's the God we worship. That's the, that's the one. That's who he is. And so uh, today, as we close, um, I want you to think about um, what God is here to help you to do today. He, he wants to meet you. He can, he, he's coming. He's being proactive like he always is. He's coming to meet you today in prayer. And what he wants to do is, is meet you in that point where you need him to restore. You may know what that is right off the bat, maybe something the Holy Spirit has to say to you, but he's come to restore and not just to fix a piece here and there. God restores fully when allowed to. He, he loves bringing things back to where they were. It's part of our series to come up. We're going to be looking at how it, how it uh, moved from Genesis and, and went through all the times when the people had left God. But God's ready today to restore. He's ready today for you to bring to him the thing that is needed. It may be a person. It may be a child. It may be a husband or a wife. He's here, and we're doing this message, I think, because the Lord is here to restore. He's here wanting to do that for you and for me. And so I'm going to pray that we would lay, lay that before the throne this morning, and, um, and we could stand back, and, and in one of our praise and prayer times, give him all the glory for the restoration happening when it does. Okay, would you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, that you are a God who restores, and not just partly, but you restore completely, Lord, when given uh, the a chance to do that in our lives, uh, given our will as it's handed over to you. So, Father, uh, we take just a moment, and Lord, we ask that uh, you would guide each of us to just bring you that person or that part of our lives that need restoration. <clears throat> it could be a way of thinking, of acting. It could be uh, an addiction of some kind. It could be um, the, a, a thought pattern that leads to, to uh, unhealthy things. Lord, you know what those things are. And they're, they're different for each one of us. So, Father, we would ask that you would come, you would bring them to our minds. <clears throat> and we come, Father, and we, we put that person or these thoughts or this thing, whatever it is, before you. And, Father, we have a simple prayer. Father, come, see this that I've laid before you. And Lord, uh, I'm asking that you would bring restoration, complete restoration, back to where it was at the beginning. Lord, if it's a relationship, complete restoration of the relationship. 
Lord, if it's if it's uh, an, an issue with thinking uh, complete restoration of our mind in, in a particular area, Lord, if it's physical, complete restoration, Lord, Father, there is nothing that you cannot do. There is nothing that you do not know about us. So, Father, for those of us struggling to come up with what may need to be restored, Lord, you see their heart. And, Father, I ask that you would come and you would do your work in them as well. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness, your graciousness, your love, that you're proactive in our lives that you offer life-changing power. And Father, we want to be there first in line to, to take you up on that. We love you, Lord God, and we place ourselves before you as your disciples. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.